Hi, I'm Melanie Smith. I play the character of Tora Ziel on Deep Space Nine, and you'll be listening to us on Trek Untold. Hello and welcome to Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I'm your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. On Deep Space Nine, there was a character who had the distinction of being played by three different actresses across the entire series. There's not a lot of those characters out there. And other than this one, the only one that really comes to mind is Alexander Roshenko, who was played by four different actors, but that's a story for a different day. The character we're discussing on this week's episode is Tora Zial, the daughter of Gold Dukat and Tora Naprim a Bajoran woman who Dukat fell in love with during the Cardassian occupation and had a child with. Zial is first revealed in the season 4 episode Indiscretion, and upon learning all about her, really kind of changes the course of Dukat's character. But of course, by season 5, well, uh, Dukat's gonna Dukat, so yeah, we know how that turns out. Zial has been played by three different performers. First, Sia Batten, then Tracy Middendorf, and finally, today's guest, Melanie Smith who played her for six episodes until the bitter end of Zial's story. You might also remember Melanie from her appearances on Beverly Hills 90210, As the World Turns, Melrose Place, Seinfeld, Blossom, Matlock, Murder She Wrote, Curb Your Enthusiasm, and more, before moving on from acting over a decade ago to pursue a new career, which we'll also spend a little time talking about today. To steal a word that Gray likes to use on Star Trek Discovery, Melanie is incandescent and brings a big energy along with her great stories about her time in Hollywood that also answer a lot of questions about the character of Zial. And of course, much more than just her time in Trek. So get ready for a deep dive with the final version of this fan favorite DS9 character whose career goes far past the reaches of merely the Star Trek franchise with the spectacular Melanie Smith. But before we begin this week's episode, if you'd like to support this show, please don't forget to follow Trek Untold on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to get the latest updates and all sorts of other fun Star Trek-related content. You can also check us out on Patreon at patreon.com slash trekuntold, where you can support this show for as little as $2 a month. At higher tiers, you can check out the shows before they come out, know about my guests in advance, and even have a chance to ask them questions, among other benefits coming soon. Shout out to our sponsor, Triple Fiction Productions who create 3D printed toys and prop replicas inspired by Star Trek. Their items come in all shapes and all sizes and are always amazing, but you're going to hear a little bit more about them later on in the show. If you're listening to us on iTunes or any other audio platform that allows for ratings and reviews, please leave us a five-star rating and a positive review. If you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to us at youtube.com slash nerdnewstoday and give the video a thumbs up and a comment. Doing any of those things help keep this show growing and allow me to continue bringing you awesome guests and great conversations every single week. Now, without further ado, let's beam in this week's guest. Computer, access interview file. And welcome back to Trek Untold, and we're now speaking with a performer who you've seen on DS9, but not quite in this way, because if you saw her on DS9, it will be covered up in Cardassian makeup. We are joined right now by Melanie Smith. Melanie, how are you? I'm terrific. Thank you. How are you? Happy holidays. Thank you. Happy holidays. For folks who don't know, we're filming this during the holidays, so if you listen to this years in the future, you'll know why we said that. <laughs> <laughs> or you could just cut it out. <laughs> no, I'm leaving it in. I'm leaving it in now. <laughs> So yeah, Melanie, it's been it's great to meet you. Uh, I'm really excited to talk to you because you are the third Zial, one one of three. Uh, it's such an interesting role, and I'm looking forward to getting into that. But uh, first things first, I'd like to ask you the question I start all these episodes with. And that's Melanie, what's your earliest memory of Star Trek? Well, the original Star Trek is my earliest memory. You know, I mean, Captain Kirk and Spock and. Um, one of my favorite episodes from back then was when there were the little animals, those little. Do you remember what they were called? Are you talking about the Tribbles? The Tribbles, yeah. That was that was a big one. I remember that one. Um, but I used to watch it all the time. I just can't recall a lot of them. I remember uh, that Captain Kirk always had a pretty girl. <laughs> <laughs> so can you give us a little bit of uh, background about yourself? Can you tell us uh, where you were born, what your parents did for a living, and what little Melanie wanted to be when she grew up? Well, my dad owned his own business. I'm from Scranton, Pennsylvania. And my father owned his own business. He owned a deodorizing business. And basically what that means, it was before there were, you know, 
easy to get air fresheners and things like that. His his company distributed air fresheners and sanitizer to like government buildings and hospitals and things. He made those. Uh, and it was interesting because he, I never realized my father worked with essential oils until I started making fragrance. I'm a fragrancer part time. It's just a kind of like a side hustle that I like. But, um, and that's when my dad started talking about that with me that he used to mix his own essential oils for his own air fresheners, which I thought was really cool. Interesting. And my mom was a stay at home mom, my younger years, and then she became a tax assessor later on in life. Um, and close family, six kids, five girls, one boy, my poor brother. Um, but for myself, I it's funny, I, I never really dreamt of being an actress or anything like that. Um, I think for a period of time, I wanted to be a fashion designer. Uh, I think I wanted to be a psychologist. I think I wanted to be an interior designer. Uh, and then my secret is I wanted to be a Navy SEAL. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a big jump from uh, someone involved in fragrances to now going underwater on uh, deep ops missions. <laughs> And back then it wasn't a lot. There were no women. I think it was just 2016. They started letting women into the seals. So as somebody who is a native of Scranton, you must have an opinion about the office. Oh, well, I mean, it was brilliant. It was, you know, some of the funniest lines ever on that show. Um, I don't remember life like that in Scranton, <laughs> you know, but I'm glad it took place in Scranton because it kind of put us back on the map a little bit. Um, there was also that championship season that was done there, but I didn't watch it that frequently. When I did watch it, I thought it was really funny. So you mentioned all these different ideas you wanted to do as a professional, you know, once whatever you're doing. Um, did you go to school for acting or did you go to school for something else? Or what, what were you basically doing like once you became uh, of age to do something that wasn't living at home? And uh, well, I actually went to day. university for public relations and psychology. Oh, um, so that's a good and combination. And I was a dancer um, and I danced uh, with my dance company at school. And then I danced with a dance company in Bryn Mawr. You know, after that, I kind of went out into the world and I was like, is that what I want to do with my life? I wasn't sure. So I did a lot of different things. I got my real estate license. Um, I was a model for a while with Elite Petite. And I really didn't click with any of it. And, and, um, and then one day my best childhood girlfriend, my girlfriend Lisa, called me and she was gonna get in trouble because she had forgotten to send three girls on a talent search. She was with a, it was a big agency at the time. It was called Triad. And she said, you know, if I don't, if I don't send girls, I'm gonna get fired. And she, I, I don't know what to do. I'm not dancing. I had bursitis in my hip. I'm not dancing. I can't, you know, how, what am I supposed to do? And she said, I don't care, just read from a book. So I took a book off my bookshelf and I showed up. She's like, nobody's gonna notice you. There's gonna be like 7,000 girls there. It's for a talent competition for Dick Clark. So I just went and I brought a book and I read from the book. And the next thing I knew, it was Mary Jo Slater and Mary Lynn Henry. Um, they said, you gotta go see this acting coach. We want you to get headshots done. And I was like, no. And I called my girlfriend. I said, this is crazy. And she said, you have to go because I'll definitely get fired if the person they want to see back from the agency doesn't go. So I went through all the rounds. And from that point on, it was like it just kind of took off and an agent signed me. And then a few months later, I had As the World Turns and I had a couple of feature films. And then I worked nonstop for over 20 years. But but once I got on World Turns and I saw that I didn't know how to act, <laughs> Is that your very I first very gig? Quick, that was my first gig. I very quickly signed up for Neighborhood Playhouse and they worked my schedule in so I could study. Um, so I did study at Neighborhood Playhouse and then I studied at the uh, uh, Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York um, and studied with Stella Adler in her master classes. And I took it really seriously. I really, I, if I was going to do it, I wanted to do it well. So when I discover, and this is a note to everybody out there, like sometimes the universe doesn't always choose who's qualified, but it'll always qualify who it chooses. So like, if you get opportunities, say yes, don't be afraid of them. Just go like, yeah, okay. I just went, okay, I'll take the job. And then I learned how to do it in the field. And everybody else on that show, oh my God. I mean, I was working with Tony Award act winning actors. I mean, they were, you know, 
Julianne Moore, and you know, I mean, there it was. We had a great company at World Turn, so it really taught me the craft, not only from studying at neighborhood, but in the field, working with all these incredible actors that I worked with. Yeah, that has to be very intimidating because you're basically learning as you go on the job. That, that's that's pretty rough. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's funny. I I wasn't a, a nervous person, so I, it didn't make me anxious, but I was diligent. You know, and I took it really seriously. And I, you know, I never missed a line. I never missed a mark. I was never late. I, I just, I, I came in and I knew if I was going to be with these people, I was going to have to, you know, step my game up, be a real pro. And we've talked a lot about Stella Adler and her school on this show before. And I'd love to know uh, what's something that you learned that school that uh, you still used for basically your entire career. Was, was there like one lesson that just stuck with you that you would always go to when you had to do a job? I think one of the things I learned, not just from Stella, but from most of my teachers, was character development. Everybody has something in them where they can say lines naturally, so they don't, you know. But the true work of an actor is understanding what character is saying those lines, right? You, you have to do real character development. You have to do real script analysis before you just decide how you're going to do a line reading or right or or act a scene you have to really understand what's happening and you have to understand who it's happening to and so that was that she really drove that into us and she was tough i mean some of my teachers were very very tough teachers she was class you know classical teacher she was she could be really she could be really tough she would like i was like i said i was a dancer and i remember some of my dance teachers you know they would hit you you know, back then it was politically correct. They could hit you, you know, and it, Stella would do that more like verbally. She would hit you, you know, she was, <laughs> she was tough, but you, but it thickened you and it drove you and, and it, 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 it connected the talent in the room. It, it was a whole different world back then. So, you know, she probably would have been canceled now. <laughs> Well, I'm very curious to hear how those lessons from Stella would go into your Star Trek role. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But, uh, you know, I, I was looking through your resume, watching some of your uh, older work, and I had a lot of fun doing that. And I was so excited to find out that you were on Seinfeld. You did three episodes of Seinfeld. And those three are like such good episodes, because for folks who don't know, uh, if even if you never watch Seinfeld, it's the Schindler's List episode and the Shrinkage episode. That's all you need to know. <laughs> but uh, I'd love and the to hear, opposites. you know, what... and the opposite. Uh, and the opposite, which is another good one too. <laughs> yeah. But, oh my God, Trinkage to this day is still a classic. Um, but yeah, how were your experiences on that set? I mean, it seemed like you kind of just blended right into that. And I've heard that's from you know a lot of other guests we've spoken to who did Seinfeld. They kind of just blended right into the cast and had no issues. I mean, did you feel like it was a very welcoming environment to be in? I loved working on that show. You know, I, I was hired to do the two episode special, The Schindler's List. And when I completed that, Jerry called me at home and said, "If we write for you, will you stay?" Um, and, and I said, okay, <laughs> all right. Um, and then I ended up leaving, uh, cause I did get another, I, I, I did get another job. I was so, um, but it was great. You know, they're, they're absolutely the quickest minds around. I mean, you, you, you're at a loss. I mean, even the cast rap party, you know, Jerry just got up and, spoke and everything he said was hysterical. I mean, these are the sharpest minds you'll ever be around between, you know, Jerry and Larry David and, and Peter Melman and Larry Charles. I mean, like they're all, all just brilliant minds. And, and that's the thing about being an artist and being an actor. Um, and I say artist because I find this, I'm also a, a, a musician and it's like, as a, a singer, I don't play an instrument, but, and I write. But when you're around people that are, world-class like you grow exponentially just being around them there's a way they have of doing things nothing teaches us faster than watching models right and so being around these world-class models you just go in and you absorb so much of it I hadn't done a lot of comedy I had done some I hadn't done a lot I was mostly considered a dramatic actress so it was really a cool thing to go in and meet with all of them and to get this job that you know they had seen so many girls for this one hour special um so i, I felt very blessed that i had gotten the role um and then growing with them and watching the way jason did things and the way you know uh, michael did things and his entrances like what's going on behind that door before he does one of those crazy things and 
surprisingly enough, what you would find is he would meditate. You know, you'd think he'd be doing something wild and crazy out there, but he'd be centering himself so he could find his, his acting intuition, you know, and his instincts. And so, yeah, I, I really loved working with them. And I always make a joke because they had the best craft service in the business. <laughs> well, that's really the most important part of any job is how good their food is. That's exactly right. And <laughs> that's exactly right. And I'm not sure if you're aware of Melanie, but uh, Jason Alexander actually was in an episode of Star Trek. He did an episode of Star Trek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Called Think Tank. And, uh, you know, we've talked about Jason on the show a bunch before as well. And, uh, you know, again, we mentioned shrinkage. And that scene yeah. you have with George is amazing. The reaction still holds up. It's still hilarious. Uh, there's got to be some story behind that scene. I mean, do you remember anything from that shoot day? Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, first of all, you know, even at the table read, everybody loved the episode. It was just very funny. But when we started to shoot that scene, it was really in the script. What it said was, um, you know, I'm sorry. I thought this was the baby's room. That was it. In dress rehearsal, I opened the door and I looked and I went, you know, I'm sorry. And then I looked at his private area and I went, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. And I started laughing. I thought this was a baby and I left and then and everybody broke out laughing. And Larry was like, can you do that again? Because that really wasn't scripted. So I was like, of course. And so I did it again. And, and it's funny because that was this kind of moment that, you know, of every sort of grouping that I did, like I have my world turns community and then I have my Aaron Spelling community for the Aaron Spelling shows I did. And then I have my Star Trek people and I have my Seinfeld people, right? And somebody actually asked me once in a podcast, can you tell the difference if someone's about to approach you? Can you tell which is which? And I kind of can. And one of the other things that I said was most of my Seinfeld fans are male, right? They're like, so that's kind of a funny thing. But that shrinkage episode of all of them has really uh, been iconic for me, you know, like people always remember it they all you know they might call me shrinkage um you know i remember when i was opening my business here i got a call from oprah's producers saying you know oprah wants to use a clip of you uh for the reunion show because that's her favorite moment uh is that okay and i was like you know sure tell oprah i said it's okay <laughs> um, and you know, that moment was voted like the funniest moment in television history by AOL and by Barbara Walters. And so it was funny that this moment, the sort of alchemy of all of us together ended up being a kind of a classic moment. Yeah, that's really fascinating that too, that you mentioned how uh, you can basically tell the fan by kind of just when they first look up to you, you know, but their initial reactions. So I feel like this is like the perfect segue to lead into my next question. Because I think this is going to come out of left field based on what you're probably looking at all around you right now on the screen. Uh, I love Murder, She Wrote. And you did two episodes uh, of you wrote, and I just got to rewatch those. And, uh, you know, man, I love hearing Angela Lansbury stories. So, uh, you know, first of all, we got to mention the episode uh, was a Scent of Murder, and then you were again in Deadly Bidding. Uh, you got to do scenes with Angela in both those episodes. But what I kind of found interesting, too, and not, you could talk about this, I felt like those two characters you did were so similar, and uh, maybe you can confirm or deny this. I think they reused your wardrobe when you reappeared in the second episode that you did, did they? Nope. Really? Because there's like a suit or like a suit dress that you're wearing. It looks so similar. It's not the same thing? Not the same thing. Wow. Okay. And, and there's actually a story around that. It's funny you say that. First of all, Angela is the most elegant, generous, compassionate, uh, brilliant woman I've ever met. She's extraordinary. Um, and I don't know what, I've told this story before, but it's like, it was one of my favorite moments in Hollywood. I don't know what possessed me to do it. I was headed to my dressing room, my trailer, and I saw Angela's trailer. And it was like, it was like a mega trailer. Like it was like, it was like the Taj Mahal trailer. And I looked over at it and I went, went to the wardrobe person. I said, give me my wardrobe. And I took my wardrobe and they're, you know, they're just watching me. They don't know me, I'm a guest star. And I fling it over my shoulder and I walk over to Angela's trailer and I see her coming. And I walk up the steps to her trailer, like I'm going to go into her dressing room. And I turn around and I go, I'm sorry, can I help you? And she says, no, I'm sorry, can I help you? And I said, no, no, I'm good. And she goes, um, that's my dressing room. And I said, oh, no, no, that's my dressing room. And she said, no, no, that's my dressing room. And she points to her name and I said, yes, they're taking that down. This is my dressing room. Who are you? 
<laughs> and she stops and she looks at me and I go, gotcha, you know, something like that. And she starts to laugh. Um, and when we met formally on set, she sat with me. She's like, you remind me of a young me. And we just chatted and chatted and we had a wonderful time. We really connected. She took such good care of me. Flash forward, uh, my sister was killed in a car crash. And my Angela called me and she said, I heard about your sister. Come back. I want you to do another show. Wow. And I want to keep you busy. Now, most people don't know this, but Angela likes to cast, or at least from what I remember when I was on it, she casts the show from people she sees. She doesn't really audition. It's sort of, she holds it more like a theater company in a way. And, and I went back and she was so wonderful and so protective and so nurturing. And here's the wardrobe part of it. They had made me this black velvet dress. I think it was actually a royal blue. It looks black on camera. I think it was a royal blue. It was this gorgeous portrait neckline. And uh, the underarms were too tight on me. <laughs> and so I'm walking around. And every time we'd have a break, I'd lift my arms like this. And Angela would say, what are you doing with your arms? And I said, well, the armpits are a little tight. And they're really uncomfortable. So until we're back to filming, I'm just going to hold my arms up. And she said, we're all taking a break. And she had me take the dress off. She sent it back to wardrobe. Now, it's expensive to take a break like that. And she took a break and she had them rework the dress so that I was comfortable in it. And it was not a long scene. So yeah, see, that was not the same. That was made for that episode, yeah. That's amazing. Uh, it's anytime I talk to people about Angela Lansbury, it's like each time I hear a new story about her, it's always better than the last. It's amazing just what a great person she was really. And is, and continues to be. Well, she's a legend. And yeah. I think people who become legends are the real deal. I think people that struggle with kindness struggle with their internal generosity, right? And I think when someone has such abundance of talent and so authentic that it's not hard for them to be loving and generous and to be an inspiration and to be a great role model. And she was a great role. I mean, I only worked with her a few weeks of my life, but she became very dear to me. All right, so something else, uh, it's a little awkward to talk about here, Melanie, but uh, I'm trying to find a good way to preface this. It's an uh, awkward question, but uh, you did an episode of The Adventures of Briscoe County Jr. with Bruce Campbell, yeah. another actor I really admire, love his work. Uh, love and, you, and you did this episode called uh, Bly, uh, By Bly, I believe it was, and you are a character who does a nude scene with Bruce Campbell, and I believe this is your second nude scene in your career. Um, so, I mean, what was it like doing a nude scene on this big set in front of Bruce Campbell? That is, that's got to be a story. Well, I was a naked time traveler. Yes. Which, which I, I assume has a lot of nudity. Time travel, it's so much easier. You don't have to pack. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It was actually a nude bodysuit. So I was not really nude. I was in a nude bodysuit. And so, but the, what I remember about that episode that was so much fun, I was joking at one point, and I forget whose name, I must have been yelling, oh, Briscoe or something. And I did my Mary Tyler Moore imitation. I was like, oh, Briscoe, like, you know, Mr. Grant, you know, and everybody and Bruce is like, let's do that. Let's do that. And so, of course, we did it. And then we had to fix it uh, in post because <laughs> they didn't let us keep it. Um, Bruce was wonderful. The show was a blast to work on. Um, and and yeah, that was the only that was the only television pseudo nude scene, you know, um, which got a lot of attention because, which a lot of my roles did because I was like on World Turns, I was the first television cougar. Um, you know, there were always, there was always something that kind of highlighted my roles, right? Um, but yeah, so that was a nude scene, and but it wasn't really nude. And then I had another in a film and that was that. I wasn't much for, I never did full body nudity or anything like that. Well, I'm at least happy to hear that it wasn't like a negative experience for you because on this show, we've talked to some folks who have done nude uh, appearances and uh, they're often not great and they weren't wearing body suits either. Um, so, you know, to follow up on that, was there ever a dance set where you basically were like, no, I don't want to do something because it was beyond what you felt was comfortable doing? Yeah, there was, I, there was one stunt I wouldn't do and it was a car crash stunt. Do you remember what you And it was, was interesting because 
they did the car crash stunt and the stunt person did get hurt. Oh, wow. Do you remember what show I that just, was? Um, it was a film. Um, I think it was Night Hunter. Hmm, okay. And I was doing all my own stunts and something that day just went, don't do this one. Just don't do this one. And I said, I'm, I'm not going to do the car stunt. You're going to have to get somebody else to do the car stunt because the car, you know, crashed into something and she gets knocked out or whatever. And I actually think the stunt person broke her ribs. And I was like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry that happened to you, but I knew I, I knew I didn't want to do it. Well, you made that a good choice that time. day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, I did a fight scene in a film. Oh my God, I was so excited to do it. It was like, I was so enthusiastic. I had so much fun doing it. And then when my adrenaline dropped, I went, I'm kind of in a lot of pain. Can I go see my <laughs> chiropractor? And of course, you know, I left that day and I went right to my chiropractor. But you, you, people don't realize that those scenes, when you do them, they're a lot of fun to do. They're, they're definitely choreographed. It's not like somebody's really punching you in the face or slamming you against a wall, but you are slamming yourself against a wall, right? You're trying to get it to be very authentic. And there's something about you that wants it to be so authentic that you get into it. You know, you don't bluff any of it. And then by the end of it, and maybe it's two takes, maybe it's 10 takes. I don't know. It can take time because they're getting it from all different angles. And by the end of it, you're like, oh, I think maybe I kind of hurt myself. <laughs> but that's like, that's just part of the game, you know? And, and you know, I, I thank God I handled a lot of guns in my career. So thank God nothing ever happened with that. Now, before we move into our Zial talk, there is one other pretty big Star Trek connection that you have. Uh, and I had a lot of fun doing research in this film here. So you were in Trancers 3 with Andrew Robinson. Uh -huh. Yeah, Andrew, I, I, did, did, I, did I actually it. watched the whole film. I found it online. Uh, and as soon as I saw the opening credit with Full Moon Pictures, I kind of knew what I was in for. Uh, <laughs> but I, I'm glad that's your reaction because uh, that's pretty much what I did the entire time. I loved every minute of it. It's... It is an experience. But I was so upset I didn't get an Academy Award nomination. That year. I'm surprised. <laughs> I don't know how you didn't. And it was Helen Hunt, me and Tim and Helen. Yeah, Helen Hunt, by the way, in Helen Hunt in Transfer, in the first three transfers, that just blew my mind already. But wow. Right. That was a fun movie. That was fun. That was my first. I think that was my first movie. Yeah, I think that was my first movie. And it was fun. I, you know, I was just learning one, uh, like one camera work. Right. It's very different than three camera work. Film is done on one camera. So and so is prime time, you know, drama. They're done on one camera. Um, but it's a whole different skill set than three camera work. And so I was basically just learning that stuff. And um, it was no, it was not a big budget film. Um, it, I'm surprised it even had a budget, but it did. Um, and Tim was a riot and it was fun. Yeah, it was really fun. I made a lot, I made like my first Hollywood friends on that film. Yeah. Yeah. I was watching one of the scenes in particular that really still stands out is, uh, it's you and Tom and you're doing a scene in the hallway. It's basically a shootout, but the bad guys are basically coming out one at a time. <laughs> it's just like, like, this is not a shootout. This is just them walking out to die. It's like ducks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you and, do what yeah. you can. And you've got to talk about, too, Andrew Robinson. His role, by the way, his name in this film of his character is Colonel Daddy Mother, which that I, I just I'm trying not to laugh right now. But yeah, Colonel Daddy Mother. But what, what was your first, what was it like, you know, your first time ever working with Andrew Robinson? I mean, how was he especially dealing with this really bizarre role in Transfers 3? You know what's fascinating about Andrew? He's a real thespian. It definitely he shows. Not, I mean, he took this role and he made it work. He is not a television film actor though he does television and film he's a true thespian he is theatrically trained i was theatrically trained um and you can feel the difference and that's what i mean about character development look at how developed the character of colonel mother father is that his name? Colonel is daddy colonel? mother the best name ever in cinematic history colonel daddy mother um look look at how specific his character choices are Right. And then look how specific his character choices are in Star Trek. Like that's what made him so terrific. And if you look at his body of work, but you actually watch the work, that's character development. That's the thing I was talking about when it when I talked about Stella is, um, you know, 
you can walk on and say any lines and make it seem natural, but to develop a character that has real stuff going on that is different from anyone you ever met before, that's that's really interesting to watch. And that's what he's great at. Like when I watch uh, him in that role and just him, you know, if I see Andrew Robinson and other things too, it kind of brings up uh same concept with guys like Armin Shimmerman and Jeffrey Combs, how they're doing exactly what you're talking about. But I think it's also a big part of that is that they really commit to that character. Cause that's a big part of it. If you don't commit to it, it, it all falls apart. Yeah. You have to really, you know, even being Tora Zial, I had to make real character choices for her as well. And she was very different character than I had ever played, but that's what makes acting interesting when you're riveted, right? Look at, um, Somebody like, well, my, his name just flew out of my head. Um, Alan, you Alan know, he's in, yeah, right. You look at Alan Rickman and it's like, he finds this insanely dark character, you know, that is so defined. That's not him, you know, cause then you see him do something else completely different on stage, right? It's not him. It's just this incredible, design of a human being he's come up with, you know, and that's what makes great, you know, right now the big show on air, which I love is Succession. And when you look at the character choices these people make, they're spectacular. They're all, you know, theatrically trained, these people. They're just fantastic actors. That's when acting is really fun. And I think that's one of the things that was fun about being on Star Trek is so, not only were so many people theatrically trained, but you're allowed to be theatrical, right? You can't, you can't be theatrical on some of the TV shows I've done when you're with actors who's, who've only done television. They're only, you know, they're used to being sort of a glorified talking head in a way. And they're great looking and they're very talented at, you know, telling the story and it's fun to watch them, but it's very, very different than what I'm talking about. And I think you can see that in every Star Trek character. Those are really developed characters. Trek Untold will return momentarily. Trek Untold is brought to you by Triple Fiction Productions. Triple Fiction Productions produces affordable and unique 3D printed Trek inspired products from the original series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, and the movies. Ranging from prop replicas to use in a fan film or cosplay, to accessories or playsets for figures in all different sizes, Triple Fiction Productions has got you covered. Past pieces for toys have included large centerpieces, like 10 forward from the Enterprise D, shuttlecrafts complete with working lights, and the Voyager Bridge, with smaller pieces including Borg alcoves, the Genesis device, and the dreaded arch enemy of Worf, barrels. All highly detailed products are 3D printed and hand painted in the USA, with new items added all the time, while simultaneously improving their printing quality based on fan feedback. To learn more about their products, visit triple-fictionproductions.net or visit them on Facebook at facebook.com slash triplefictionproductions. Want to get 10% off your next purchase? Use code UNTOLD10 at checkout to receive this discount not applicable during sales or clearance events. That's code UNTOLD10 to get 10% off action figure dioramas, accessories, and prop replicas. Triple Fiction Productions, taking Star Trek where no 3D printer has gone before. Hey, I'm Licia Nav, AKA Ensign Sonia Gomez from Star Trek TNG. And now Captain Sonia Gomez on Lower Decks with her own ship, the Archimedes. Yay, I finally got a promotion after 25 years. So anyway, I'm here to talk about drivebydogooders.org. It's a little charity I run where we go to the outskirts of Skid Row and from our car windows, we hand out basic human essentials like water, wipes, cold stream cheese, socks, tarps, masks, t-shirts, things to keep people warm. So we just think that everyone deserves clean water, some protein, and a way to clean themselves, especially during Corona. We also hand out masks to those who really, really need it, who live in tents on the street, mainly the disabled and elderly who have a really hard time getting to services. And we do all of this with no agenda, just pure giving, no overhead, 
If you'd like to go to the website and donate, it's 100% tax deductible. And if you click on the donate button, you can go right to the $35 option and pick a signed autograph picture of either the Star Trek The Next Generation or Lord X or Total Recall, where I played the three-breasted mutant hooker on Mars, and uh, that's the X-rated version. Put in the comments section your address and anything you'd like me to write, and I'll personally inscribe it and mail it off to you immediately. And again, that's drivebydogooders.org. Ensign, I mean, Captain Sonia Gomez, signing off. We now return to Trek Untold. All right, so Melanie, let's beam into our Star Trek discussion here. And uh, you were Tora Zial. You were the third Tora Zial to appear on Star Trek Deep Space Nine. You were there for six episodes and to the bitter end of Zial as well. Um, so let's just start at the beginning here. How did you get cast into this role? Got a call from my agent. They wanted to see me for a producer session. I said, okay. I read the script. Uh, I never watched the show. Um, and I had my own take on Torzio. And I remember I, I walked into the producer session. And there were a lot of really gifted actresses there. I, I remember, you know, some very well-known faces. And I was like, wow, my take on this character was so wrong. Because they were all in like bomber jackets and fatigues and combat boots. And I had a sundress. And my hair was up in like a kind of a little messy bun. And I had a pin on. and. I looked at Torizial as like a child of peace, like she was the ambassador of peace, you know? And I went in and I think I read with Mark and I kneeled at his feet and I did this scene because that's how I felt about Torizial. I felt like she still had innocence. She still had wonder. Um, with everything she had been through, she was still that enchanted child. So that's what I played. I mean, I went in there like that. I wasn't going to make any changes. Again, I did character development on it, right? I really decided who she was and what, what she had been through and, and how she survived and what was meaningful to her. And I, I left the audition. I said, thank you very much. I met all the producers, met Mark, whatever. I left. And as I was walking down the street, my tiny little flip phone, <laughs> remember those, uh, rang. And my agent said, don't react. They still have to read everybody else. I don't know what you did, but you got the job. And I was like, what? Like, they have a lot of other people to see. And they said, yeah, you got the job. And that really meant a lot to me because, because I realized when I went in there, I had, I guess I had taken a risk by not watching it anybody else who played the role. And I had not looked at, you know, anything that would have given me, uh, I don't know, predisposed decisions about her. Um, and that, that felt great because I really went from my level of inspiration from the script and the way I wanted to tell the story. So that's, that was the audition. And then when I went the first day, I was like, whoa, my call time's what? <laughs> I think it was 3.30 in the morning. Because it takes like four hours to put that makeup on. They've got to do the whole face and they have to put the wig on. They've got to get your hair in it and they got to glue the hair down. I mean, this is every day. And then they got to do the gluey stuff on your hands and you're in the neoprene. Like, it's a big deal. I mean, did you know um, you were going to be doing that much makeup before you got this part? I didn't understand it. You know, you don't understand it until you're under it. That's when you understand it. And then it's two and a half hours to get it off. Now, Mark would come in to the makeup room and just go <laughs> and pull it off his face. But that'll burn your face. That'll, like, really hurt your skin. And so what they do is they gently take these brushes with solution and just inch by inch they get it off your face. And now this is a, an occurrence that's going on every day, you know? So it was intense, which is why when they had, they had decided they wanted to kill a character for that season. And I was like, I'll do it, pick me. Um, and yeah, so that's sort of how that happened. Oh, we're gonna get more into that a little bit later on because I got questions about that. But uh, just as a side note, had you ever previously auditioned for like Star Trek The Next Generation or any other DS9 episodes beforehand? Yes, I went to network for uh, Terry's role. 
Oh, you went for Dax. Yeah. Do you remember yeah. much about that audition? Not, you know, it was, it's funny. I was always very busy with auditions. So they all kind of blend together. I think the only time I really remember auditions um, is when either I messed up miserably <laughs> or, or something unique happened, you know? But if things were just, went well and it was just a choice, you know, that there's, there were so many of those, I don't, you know, I don't really remember much about them. Now you were the third and last of the all, as I've said a bunch of times already, you know, there were two before you. Were you concerned at all that this was like a revolving door for the performers who had done this role and that maybe it wasn't going to be a good place to be for you? Or did you have any concerns knowing that fact before you went into this? It's a funny thing. I think one of the upsides to me as an actress, probably also one of the downsides, was I never concerned myself with any of that. I went into it as a creative person who wanted to tell a story, who, who got very involved in what the character was. I didn't, I didn't look at anything else but that. Can I tell that story? Can I relate? Can I find in me a rich enough character that they would want me to play it. And that's really the way I looked at everything because, you know, oftentimes they do replace characters and you do come in, maybe some like on As the World Turns, I came on as Emily at an older age, right? You know, daytime, they'll cast different ages, different actresses, right? Um, and I, I didn't know anything about those. I knew Jenny was the woman who played my mom was her real daughter. So I, I knew Jenny personally, but she was like a baby when she played the role. And then there was somebody that played it, I think for like six weeks after in her teen years. And then I came in, right? But I never, I never, I think it actually can hinder you. Hmm. So we already talked about Colonel Daddy Mother a few minutes ago here, but I'm wondering, you know, your first day on set when Andrew Robinson sees you, does he remember you? Does he even recognize you with the makeup on? Was there any kind of connection between you guys? Yeah, we rec we we realized it was the other. <laughs> uh, and it was like, oh my God, you know, we had a really good time working on Trancers as crazy as that film was. Um, but yeah, we, re we, we knew who we were. Yeah, we did. And I was thrilled because I thought he was fantastic. I mean, Still did he do. like... Did he kind of like take you under his wing and, and make you, you know, actually feel like you're part of the crew? I mean, how, how was it? Because you're basically walking into a set uh, and here you are. You're going to be a new recurring character, essentially. Everybody else already knows each other. I mean, uh, did anybody really kind of take you under their wing and guide you around the set and get to know people? I think everybody did. Everybody was really pretty you know, well I will friendly. tell you, this, my experience of the Star Trek cast was they were just so, such generous actors. You know, they understood that you're uncomfortable you're wearing like 50 pound wig and you've got bobby pins sticking in your skull and you're living off of Tylenol because you do have a headache from it. And, you know, you've been in your dressing room waiting for whatever and it's hot and it's, you know, you, that the neoprene smells and the make, you know, like you feel sticky, you know, you can't go in and scrub your hands or anything. You got to watch the makeup. It's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a thing. It's its own thing. There's no other show like the Star Trek shows when you're, when you're wardrobe like that, right? When you're in true costume like that. And and I felt like not only cast, but the crew understood that. You know, sometimes when you're on set and you go up on your lines or something, oh, you might get, oh my God, I can't believe I forgot. But if if it was one of those days where you were on set a long time, the set was really warm, they knew you were in this costume, everybody just was so encouraging and they, it wasn't like, oh. you know, I never saw anybody look at anybody else and go, they forgot their line or they missed their mark. It was more like, take a breath, give them a second. And they were like that with everybody. That's interesting. Cause I've heard from a lot of folks that uh, Mark, you know, Gold Ducat himself, that he can be a little bit intimidating on set. I mean, did you find that at all to be true? Mm -mm. I mean, he's intense, Mark. Yeah. He's an intense person. Now, have you had him on? I have not yet. I, I would very much like to, but uh, you know, again, using the word intense there, I'm a little intimidated already just thinking about it, but I'd love to have him on here one day. Oh, he's such a nice guy. There's nothing, you know, he's, again, he's, he's very theatrical. He's a thespian. He's skilled and he took his role very seriously, but he as a person, you can tell is intense, right? But it doesn't come across as, 
I didn't find him intimidating. I found him lovely to work with. I found everybody on the show lovely to work with. So we already kind of talked a little, a little bit about how you found Zial and how you kind of put the character together. But I'd love to hear, you know, if you can go a little bit more in depth on it. And uh, also to add on to that, what part of Melanie Smith was in Zial? And I ask this because, you know, having talked to you now for a little bit and learning a little bit more about your background, I'm like, there, there seems to be some similarities here with the creative side, things like that. So, you know, where did Zial begin? Where did Melanie Smith end? How did these two meet? You know, at the time, I was, I, I'm, I'm a big yogi. I'm a big yoga practitioner and meditator. Um, and at the time I was really immersed in that. I think I spent every weekend at a retreat, you know, either meditating or doing yoga or learning about some kind of nutritional wellness, well-being practice. And I was very into peace and health and love and all that kind of stuff, you know? And I, I think that, I don't know whether it impacted the way I made choices about Torziel or I saw that quality that I was developing in myself. I, I saw Torziel as an opportunity to express that through a character, possibly. Or it might have just been what kind of unified us so easily, right? Um, so that I remember, that was sort of that period of life where I was just very, very involved. And by the way, I was also at a period of life when I was on Star Trek um, that I had gotten into a sort of tendency with my agents and I would say to them, I really don't want a seven year contract. I wanna do long recurrings. I don't wanna be the same character for seven years. I really wanna start, I had already done a number of contract roles and I was like, I just, I just wanna go and be creative. So I do think that those two things, that sort of spiritual, you know, I just want to bring people together. I want peace. I want love in my life. Like that was a culmination of all of the work that I had been doing, you know, after my mother passed away and my sister passed away and I had grown so much. And that's actually, I talk about that. I've just finished my book. That'll be out in 22. Um, but that there, they talk about this in that book, about that part of me developing. And then all of the parts of me that, that, are creative, whether it's the actor or the dancer or the singer songwriter or, you know, um, the, the fragrance or whatever it is, the designer, any of that. I just had a natural understanding of the way I saw Tori Ziel. I think it was very different than the previous actresses, but it, I definitely saw her in a specific way. And by the way, it's a crime so far. We haven't mentioned the Na Visitor uh, because, you know, we're talking here about uh, basically the relationships that Tora Zial has on the DS9 space station here. So that's predominantly going to be with Andrew as Garrick, Mark as Goldicott, and then Kira yep. as your surrogate mother, the Na Visitor. Uh, so, you know, with all these real great powerhouses of acting that you're working with here, uh, how fluid were your performance choices when you're working with these people? I mean, because I know there's not really time for rehearsals on a Star Trek show and, and on TV in general. You don't really necessarily get that privilege to have rehearsal time. Yeah, so. you don't. Yes. Yeah, so like how, how were you able to kind of adapt to all these people? And were there times where you had to make changes and choices that you weren't sure if you were comfortable with with the character, but ultimately ended up working out for you? You know, it's a funny thing. Uh, when you work a lot and you really start to get the craft, particularly if it's a craft in a particular medium, right? So I, at this point, done a lot of television. So television stops being scary or intimidating, right? You, it's like, it's your skill set. You know, you're, you're, you get good at it. And I think everybody on the show was good at it. So there wasn't a lot of time trying to get over somebody's inadequacies, right? Like everybody was just good at it. We were all professionals. Um, Nana, as Andrew, as Mark, all of them um, were, gen you know, they just gave me what I needed. You know, if I didn't understand something, you know, what's the camera shot? What's the shot? Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Where can I walk? You know, where I remember once we did <laughs> some scene where everybody was in prison. You know, the, the, I had to have to say this. The funny thing about the show is, you know, you you have to lose, learn a lot of dialogue as an actor, right? The thing that made Star Trek challenging was there were words that didn't exist and there was no reference to them. Like there was no reference point. If somebody said, you know, 
I'm going to bake a cake. A human being, you see a cake in your brain, right? But when you say, oh, I'll make you Ramufta. <laughs> I mean, like, what is Ramufta? You know, like, and, and how do you remember that word? It's not, it's not in relationship to anything you know, or, oh, uh, Vedic name, or like, what, whatever. Like, we'd be saying words that don't exist. And that was hard. That was something I had never done before. So was it the techno babble like, kind of challenging for you? Was, was having to remember the word hesperate difficult? <laughs> that kind of threw you off a little all bit? All that was. You can't believe how, and I wasn't a Star Trek aficionado, right? I dabbled in Star Trek. I wasn't like, you know what I mean? And when I watched Star Trek, I didn't go, oh, I'll have to write that word down and learn that word, you know? Oh, that's what that is, or that's what that is. So things would show up in my script and I'd be like, how am I going to remember that? What does it rhyme with? Like what? <laughs> and, you know, they would sort of coach me through little things like that. Yeah. So I'm really curious to get your opinion on this, because obviously you're the person actually doing this stuff here. And uh, the Zial garrick relationship, this one has always boggled my mind. Just rewatching all the episodes you were in together back to back. Uh, the story, it's it's so... it. I'm trying to find the best way to put it, I guess. But, you know, there, is there a romance? Is it a father-daughter kind of relationship? Like, in your mind... What was the Garrick Zial relationship? Was oh, it I was romantic? in love with him. What, but do you feel like it was like, you know, uh, I'm just sticking it to daddy. These are my daddy issues coming through at Garrick. Or was it like you actually genuinely felt like he was the, the romance? I you? really, uh, in my opinion, I really loved him. I really loved him. I, like, remember, Tori Zial was just an ethereal being. She she was like a child. And what I loved about that is so many of my roles, I was the smart, tough, sexy, whatever. And 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 it's easy to get pigeonholed as an as an actor, particularly as an actress. And it was a real it was really refreshing to be able to get away from a look and just be a creature that could have whatever characteristics you gave them and whatever qualities you gave them and whatever, like you didn't even have to make human choices, right? You could put other completely different thoughts in your head, right? So the way Tora loved was so innocent that you might look at her relationship with Garrick and go, oh, is that like a daddy issue? But she just wanted to love. And he was kind to her and he loved her. I have no idea how you have sex in those outfits. <laughs> I don't think any of them did because they're too hard to get on and off. <laughs> I mean, Cardassians are basically like a lizard like race. So I don't even want to get into the anatomy of that. Um, but, but Right. So I don't know. I don't know how they did that if they did that. But but there was absolute. I was enamored with him. Was it like an innocent kind of puppy love? Would you say? I think deeper you know, than it's that? funny. You can say whatever you want about anybody's kind of love from the outside, but it's just love from the inside. You know, when you're in puppy love, you don't go, oh, I'm in puppy love. You go, I'm in love. Outside, they're going, oh, it's just puppy love. But inside, you're not. Right? Inside, you're just in love. And she was in, in love with him. So I guess on the inverse of that would be, and, you know, we don't have Andrew here today to kind of give us his input on this, but, uh, you know, from your perspective of where you were and how the scenes were going together, would you say that Garrick was reciprocative of this love or was he kind of like trying to keep a distance between the two? Was he actually going for romance or was it more of a father-daughter thing for the character of Garrick? My hunch, and you would have to ask Andrew, but my hunch was he did love her, but he also knew that it might not be a smart idea to act on it for a number of reasons. Okay, fair enough. And, you know, you had a lot of scenes with the, the trio of folks we've already talked a bunch about here. Uh, so I'm wondering if there's a scene in your mind that really stands out as uh, one that you really enjoyed doing. I mean, there's like a scene with Gold Dukat and Kira and you and, and the room basically talking art together. There's all sorts of different things you've had. That, that's the one? I nailed it. <laughs> I loved that scene and where uh, I think he brings me a dress. Yep. Right. I mean, that's like the perfect scene. Like, you know, I get a present, <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm bringing my family together. I'm talking about my dreams and I have these two favorite people in my life and I feel like it's working. Like, I feel like it's working there, like almost like, you know, 
I, oh my God, you know, and when I say, you know, I dream of bringing people together, I dream of bringing them together, right? But my other favorite scene was my death scene. I love, first of all, how many actors get to do a death scene? Think about that. Not a lot. Yeah. Um, yours comes totally out of left field too, which I love. Like I, I didn't grow up actually really watching D Space Nine. I wasn't really into Star Trek when it came out the first time, but my first time rewatching it, you know, many, many years ago, uh, when that scene happened, I was like, oh my God, that did not just happen. So yeah, that just is so good. Yeah, it was, it was, I was so excited when they told me that they were going to kill me. <laughs> I was so like, that's crazy. It was a matter of fact, when I did the 50th anniversary in Vegas, I can't tell you how many other characters from Star Trek came. I was like, thank you for volunteering to die. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I was so excited to do that scene because there's so much great dramatic work to do there to make it authentic. And and what was beautiful about the scene was we finally admit to each other, we love each other. We finally admit we are going to go through life together, that we have reunited. And that's my greatest moment. Right? That's my greatest moment. I have my father back. Boom, gone. And it was fun. Even though, like, obviously, there was no laser in the shot. They had to do that all post. But, you know, playing the scene, it, I don't know, it's just really fun. And Mark was great. And it was great. It was fun. Yeah, when I was doing research for this episode, you know, I read that it was actually you that requested to be killed off. And I couldn't believe that. So I, I'm still shocked hearing that that was actually like something you volunteered to do. Like, because, you know, here's this part. It's really developing along. You're six episodes into it, and you're just ready to go. I mean, was it because of the makeup? Was it just that you were ready to move on? It was, it was, the makeup was really hard on me. It was very, very hard on me. And the schedule was hard on me. And, like, look, if they had another six episodes, I would have done another six. But that was the timing. They wanted to kill somebody at that point. And I, and I thought, you know, that would be a really cool way to exit the show. I had no idea how they'd write it, but I thought that would be a really cool way. It wasn't like, oh, we got to write a character off. They were like, we have to kill a character off. They were using that word. So I was like, that's a way to go, right? Um, but I was, I, I found the makeup very hard um, and I found the schedule very hard. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to have a call time at, 3.30, 4.30 in the morning. It's, and then you're there sometimes till eight, nine o'clock at night, you know? I think it's easier when you're not in that stuff all day long. I had very bad headaches. I got very bad headaches. I got a, some allergic reaction from the makeup. It was hard on me, but it was fun. It was one of my favorite jobs. So looking back on your stint as y'all, uh, was there anything that you would do differently if you were playing that part today? No, mm-mm. No, I don't watch myself. So I hope it played the way I intended. Um, but no, I, I played that role really close to my heart. You know, I, I really did. And I don't think there was anything I would have done differently. So after your time as the all, did you ever audition to be on any other of the Star Trek shows that were out there? No, because truth of the matter is after I did Zial, I got pregnant. And I had done a, couple, a few more roles. Um, and that's when I decided it was really difficult for me to be a mother and an actress. I, you know, I was on a series called The Division uh, on Lifetime, where I played my, my best girlfriend and I played sisters on it. And um, it was where I realized I have to go be a mother. I can't. I can't keep doing this. Like I, I, I was on set, I'd be thinking about my son, I'd be with my son, I'd be thinking about my script. And it started to split me down the middle and I felt like I wasn't great at either one of them because I wasn't in, all of me was not in the whole, you know, whole in each pla different place. So I made that decision shortly after Star Trek to leave and raise my son. Is, is there anything else Star Trek we didn't mention? I know my, my fans are always hungry about any Trek stories. Is there anything that you usually tell in any of your convention appearances that we haven't gotten to here? Um, I'm trying to think, I, you know, there were so many lovely experiences on that show. Um, you know, I remember, I, I just remember some of the sets and how 
kind of overwhelming they could feel at first, like you said, and how everybody sort of just like made that such a simple thing to understand. You've got on set and they, you know, someone would say, it looks this way, but don't be blah, blah, blah. And you'd sort of like, just get your hand, get the hang of it, you know? Um, and I, you know, when you say those were definitely those, those were two of my favorite scenes, but I really loved all of them. I loved, you know, like um, there were some of the scenes in that bar, right? And we were all together. And, you know, when the camera was off, there was a blast. You know, and think about that, like we're all in these ridiculous outfits just goofing around that if anybody was looking from the outside, they'd be like, what's up with that? So it was really a fun experience. And as I said, it was one of my favorite jobs ever. I wish that the makeup was not so hard on me. I did, I did because I loved the character and I loved the people. And as I said, I, the two times that I did come into the world of Star Trek, Torres Eyal and was when I was, you know, uh, Terry Farrell's role of Dax. Yeah. Which, by the way, <laughs> a couple of dots on your <laughs> with a cool cat suit. All good. <laughs> Whole different animal. Oh, yeah, completely, completely. And uh, you know, just just one last thing on Zial, too, because we didn't even mention it. But I think this is probably a good way to end, end our uh, DS9 talk here. You got to wear some pretty nice dresses. Uh, you got to have a pretty nice wardrobe as Zial. I mean, did you like the wardrobe or did you have any issues like you did on the set of Murders you wrote? Um, well, you know, those <laughs> costumes are all made of neoprene, you know, so they were great looking. I mean, the, the, the designers, the creators, the set design, they're geniuses, these people, you know, and, and by the way, I have to say most of the Star Trek fans that I met are brilliant. You know, it's not, it's, <laughs> I've told this story before on an, uh, somewhere I can't remember, but the night before the the reunion, not the reunion, I'm sorry, the 50th anniversary in Vegas, I had gone out to dinner and nobody knew what I looked like really, right? So I could just go into the restaurants and listen to everybody. And like, what y'all know is crazy. Like you catch mistakes that writers make through lineages from the original one to the last one and like what year they made the mistake. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I don't, I don't even know what I had for like lunch yesterday. And you, <laughs> you guys know that that child doesn't really belong to that person because in 1971, there was an episode that, you know, so it's like the whole community is so committed to this writing. Um, it, it, it's unique unto itself as far as being a fan base, right? It's a very unique fan base and really extraordinary. Although I will say, I don't think that uh, Cardassian Majoran makeup hurt you too bad because your skincare looks amazing, by the way. I just want to say. <laughs> Thank you. And I just turned 59 Thursday. Or am I allowed to air that? That doesn't sound like I should be airing yeah. that information. <laughs> That's okay. I got one more year. Next year, I'm 60, man. It's a, it's a interesting transition. So we've kind of talked a little bit about it throughout this interview also, but, you know, you mentioned now you, at this point you, you've left acting to raise your kids, but what's Melanie Smith doing today? I mean, now that you're, you're far removed from the world of acting, what are you up to these days? Well, I still get offered things sometimes, and um, I haven't seen anything I would be excited about doing right now. But after I left and I, I moved away, I opened a, a wellness center, which did phenomenally well. We, we became recognized as one of the top in the country. Um, and globally recognized for my training programs. Uh, it was in yoga, wellness, etc. I had a retail boutique. And then I sold that in 2011, but I took my private practice as a coach. Uh, I coach any, basically I coach CEOs, achievers, uh, founders, people who want to restructure their lives, people who want to reinvent their lives. Um, people who want to transition. So for example, right now, I have a lot of people coming to me post pandemic -y stuff, changing from one career to another. Um, I also coach on loss, transition and grief. So that's the foundation for my coaching practice. That's also the foundation. That's also the premise of my book that'll be out in 22. Um, so yeah, I, I have a business that's called Work With Melanie Smith, that's my website. And I help people lead their finest life. You know, if you feel stuck, if you feel like there's unfinished business that's blocking your path moving forward, we work together, we get you past self-esteem issues, we get you past 
um, you know, your belief systems that perhaps might not let you fulfill your dreams, right? Or to recover from something, perhaps you're coming out of a, a long-term marriage or a, a heartbreak or loss of family member. Maybe you're going from one job to another. I have people come to me who have been in the same profession for 40 years and want to, you know, start a business or, or become an, I have a, I have, ta I have talent that comes to me. They've been, you know, Ivy League top executives that now want to be creatives, right? And so I coach brands, I coach people, um, and that's what I do uh, as my day job, which I love. Um, and uh, and then I'm also right now in the middle of uh, producing, co-producing a, a five song jazz EP where I'll be singing. Yeah. And by the way, we should mention too, does this book have a name? Do we have a title for the book yet? No, nah, I can't say it yet. Okay, That's so we'll a, stay tuned on that. Yeah, we'll stay tuned on that. But you, I will let you know as soon as I'm allowed. Yes. All right, because I'm sure my listeners are going to definitely want to pick that book up. Uh, and so, you know, kind of follow up this uh, this path here you've had, you know, from acting to life coaching. Did any of your stuff from acting kind of flow into what you're doing as a life coach? Is there any of that that has kind of instructed or informed your decisions uh, of how you life coach? I don't quite know how to verb that, but uh, I think you know what I mean. <laughs> well, I think a number of the answer, that's a great question. And for a number of reasons, the answer is yes. One of the other things that I teach is public presence and public speaking. And I was trained by one of the top public speaking coaches years ago um, when I started speaking around the country when I was on television. But so just having that ability to have the experience of speaking as often as I did and of understanding what it means to be a public presence and what your what your stature and how you carry yourself means. That was a really big part of that part of my company. Um, but as an actor and in the business of acting, I sat at the biggest tables and the biggest arenas, right? And I went, I mean, when you're a successful actor on a successful show, so from World Turns, which is at the, at the time, World Turns was the number one show in the world. I mean, above any primetime show. So like, I couldn't go to any country at that point without being inundated with paparazzi and fan. Like seriously, hotels would take me in the back door. If I would go to Disney World, they I would have to have, you know, greeters and people, you know, escorting me everywhere. And and so when you have and by the way, that's a strange thing for a kid from Scranton, Pennsylvania. I don't know from that, you know, like, you know, I come from a middle class family. It's a a working class family. And and so that really gave me a fearlessness and an understanding, you know, when you sit at a table with the people who make the biggest decision decisions and you negotiate, it gives you a skill set you don't get in college, right? That's all they teach you perhaps negotiations, but they don't teach you how to negotiate, right? That's found in the field. So I think so many things that I discovered as an actor playing different characters, right? It gave me in-depth psychology of people. Um, I think it really allowed me to trust my own instincts and to grow uh, and to have a real understanding of all different kinds of people. My world was enormous, right? Even if you just look at the groups of people that I was interacting with from daytime, from my fans, you know, with Star Trek, Aaron Spelling shows, Seinfeld, Blossom, Murder, she wrote, like all that, they're all different tribes, right? So people come to me now from different tribes and I have an understanding of their world because of that. That's very hard to get that kind of experience if you didn't do what I did, right? You can't, you can't go to, you can't get that experience at Harvard. So it does contribute. It does absolutely contribute. All right. So Melanie, as we wrap things up here, just real fast, real, we're going to throw some real uh, fast questions at you here. Best day on a set, worst day on a set. Best day on a set. Oh, um, oh my God. There were so many good days on sets. Um, that's a hard question. Oh, I think one of the funniest at least days on set was when when I was on Seinfeld and I was working with Dee Dee Pfeiffer, Michelle Pfeiffer's sister. And one of the assistant, the ADs, somebody came up and said, did you hear there's someone really famous, sister <laughs> on set? 
And I said, yeah, that's me. I'm Jacqueline Smith's sister. And that just spread like wildfire until I kind of dragged, you know, Dee Dee out. And I was like, no, I'm just kidding. It's actually Michelle. You know, you look at the spelling and there's how many Pfeiffers are there, right? Um, so that got a big, we had a lot of fun playing around on the, on the Seinfeld. And, oh, and the other thing on Seinfeld was when Jerry and I used to do yoga together in the green room. That was really fun. So the roughest day on set, I was working on a show called Nowhere Man. Uh, with great Bruce Greenwood, who's an amazing actor and just a, a fantastic human being. And I had to run and I sprained my ankle, but I fractured my foot. And I really don't know why, but for two days, I would still have to do that scene, some running scenes. And then when I would stop, I would have to put my foot in ice and then they put it in heat and then they put it in ice and they put it in heat. And I almost actually ended up leaving the show because I was in so much discomfort. So I think that was probably my worst um, experience. Uh, and as far as best, like there were just so many of them. I had so many great days on sets um, with amazing people. You know, that is the blessing of being an actor is you develop these relationships with groups of people that become family. So I would have to say best on set every day. Worst was when I, and, it, and believe me, Bruce was so good to me when I hurt my foot. You know, everybody was lovely, but that was, that was tough. That was tough. So Melanie, uh, something that you know today that you wish you knew back when you first started acting. I think what is a great piece of wisdom that I wish I knew throughout my whole life, even during that period, is that what matters the most is peace of mind. That everything we accomplish in this life, everything we become or don't become, has nothing to do with how the essence of who we are comes across to people. Like, I wish I knew then, I guess, that, um, Life is long. As much as people talk about how short it is, life is long. And you have to find a form of bliss in everything you do. And don't make things stressful. You know, I think one of the reasons I had the length of the career that I had, and I had the successes I had, was because I trusted that everything that was mine was going to come to me. Um, but I do think I could be hard on myself back then. And I, I think now, uh, as an adult, I realize that it doesn't get you anywhere any faster, right? Just show up in the world with your gifts and your purpose and your talent and your compassion and your love and your sincerity, and it will all work out. Okay, that's a great piece of advice there. And uh, kind of following that one up here, too, uh, was there ever a maybe piece of advice you got from a colleague on a set somewhere, something that you learned either about acting or life from someone else who uh, maybe had been around more experience than you uh, that you held on to and continued to use to this day? Absolutely. I'll never forget the moment. I was sitting in one of Jerry's Porsches with him, and uh, we had just had lunch and we were talking, and we were sitting in the car, just sort of looking straight ahead. And I said, Jerry, so what is it? What's the best part of being you right now, right? The most successful comedian in the world, the number one show, everything he ever dreamed of, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, is it the money? Is it the cars? Is it what? And he said, it's finding out I am exactly who I always thought I was. And that was when that became my goal right? Not some exterior metric, but when you know you are exactly who you always thought you were, that's success. That's some heavy Oprah stuff right there. That's a good one. I'm going to write that one down. <laughs> is this like must-see podcast? <laughs> I think it is now, yeah. I'll take my check now, NBC. Thank you. Um... <laughs> So Melanie, last thing for today, and I feel like this is actually, uh, you just gave me a perfect answer to the segue into this question here, but uh, what's the best thing about being a part of the Star Trek universe? And I feel like you already answered this, in fact, but uh, yeah, what, what is the best thing for you about being part of this universe here? The fans. It's the fans. I mean, I, I love you guys. You're you're committed and you, you just have so much like continued interest, you know, and enthusiasm and love for the characters. I mean, when I, I only did that one, uh, that one anniversary 
live show. I had only done one of those, but oh my God, there was so much love and, and, you know, just sincerity. And it was such a great group of people. Yeah, uh, definitely the fans. I mean, look, the fans make any show, whether actors want to talk about it or not. The truth of the matter is, number one, there'd be no show without you. Number two, you feed, whether you realize it or not, the writing of the characters, right? Because if something's working, ratings are good. If something's not working, you start to see some flux, right? So it's like you guys and your enthusiasm and knowing all the things you know, you're a great group. You really are a great group. Well, Melanie, thank you so much today for telling us all these inside Star Trek stories and all these fun stories about Seinfeld and, of course, Angela Lansbury and everything else here and really imparting, I think, a lot of really great wisdom on us. And uh, it's been really exciting to learn about you and just revisit all of your career. It's, of course, it's always fun rewatching Zial, but just seeing everything else you did, everything else you accomplished, uh, it's been truly awesome. So thank you, Melanie, so much for sharing all this with us today. Well, thank you for having me. I really love, you know, like I said, staying involved and connected to um, all of you that loved this show and continue to love it. Um, and and I'll see you again soon, I'm sure. And I'll let you know when my book comes out. And if anybody needs to find me, it's work with Melanie Smith and you can visit me there. All right, so everybody go ahead, check that out and make sure to uh, be there. Stay tuned. You'll get all the information coming up as soon as we know. So Melanie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everybody, for listening. That's it for this week's episode of Trek Untold. Until next time, please don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you're in a position to financially support the show, please consider becoming a supporter over on patreon.com slash trekuntold or pick up some merchandise from our Redbubble store. If you're looking for direct links for any of these things, links will be right in the show notes. Special thanks to Scott Ray for providing us with this week's guest. If you'd like to book them for an autograph signing or convention appearance, email Scott at scottray67 at aol.com. If you have any questions or comments for the show, or would like to suggest a guest, or discuss any sponsorship ideas with us, send me a message at trekuntold at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to Trek Untold and for continuing to support this show. I hope you'll come back next time to learn more stories about Star Trek and beyond. Until then, I'm Matthew Kaplowitz, and always remember, fortune favors the bold. Trek Untold is sponsored by treksphere.com. Promoting fan-produced Star Trek content in all forms is powered by the RageWorks Podcasting Network and is affiliated with Nerd News Today.